All right. So everybody that's listening to this, if you are listening to us on the podcasting sites, whatever it may be, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, definitely share this interview. If you're listening to us on the run of the radio stations, we're on 20, thank God, around the country, uh, some in Florida, some outside of Florida. We thank you for listening to that. And just make sure if you tell your friends, your family members, what station you're listening to us on so they can listen. We're getting a lot of big interviews. And obviously with the political season heating up with the primaries coming up, we're going to get more people involved in our democratic process here in the United States. Uh, let's kick this around. We have a good person coming on, going to be talking about Florida politics, how it's changed throughout the years. The book is The Modern Republican Party in Florida. It's by Peter Dunbar. He's going to be speaking to us about this book and about Florida politics in general. I have the book here. Hopefully everybody that's watching this uh, can see the book here. I would tell anybody that's you have listening. To lift, Rob, Robert, you have to lift it up so you can show the picture of our governor. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> Very sorry. Uh, governor DeSantis Very. is there. As a person that's a registered voter in the state of Florida, I, I do like a lot of the stuff that Governor DeSantis has been doing. Uh, COVID-19, phenomenal job. Uh, also, I believe that he's done very well in fighting all the woke ideology that's being pushed through many states, and it's not coming to Florida. Thank God for that. Uh, Peter, first of all, thanks so much for coming on. I know you're a veteran of Florida politics, and thank you for coming on here and getting ready to spread a lot of great knowledge of the state of Florida and the politics that goes on. Robert, I appreciate the invitation. I'm looking forward to it. Let's, let's get right on about it. All right, let's kick it around. So, you know, I talked that you're a veteran of Florida politics. Just tell the audience a little bit about yourself as we just get into the meat and potatoes of this interview, Peter. Sure. I, I Obviously, you can tell by my nice gray silver hair that I've been around a while. Um, I began, I went to school here in the capital, uh, in Tallahassee, where I am today. Um, and when I was in undergraduate school, I was hired on to be on legislative staff. And it happened to be the year uh, when everything changed instantaneously in Florida. First Republican governor since Reconstruction, uh, Republicans serving in the House and Senate in meaningful numbers. So they actually got committee assignments and things like that. Uh, so it, it all began in 1967 for me. Um, I finished my, my undergraduate work here, then law school here, stayed on staff, um, went then back to my home area in the Tampa Bay area and um, came back and forth be, as a young lawyer to speak before the legislature on behalf of clients. And then uh, just as I turned 30, was elected to serve as a member of the Florida House spent 10 years in that capacity and was invited to join the second Republican governor since Reconstruction, Bob Martinez, uh, to join his staff as general counsel um, and director of legislative affairs and did serve three years in that capacity. Uh, since then, I've been an advocate in the private sector um, and remain in the Capitol. So long way around saying, I just finished my 57th regular session in one capacity or another. And it's been very interesting to see the people, see the changes, um, and it's been a very dynamic uh, professional career for me. So Peter, let's talk about some of these changes that have happened throughout the years. You kind of touched on a little bit in the last answer, but go a little bit more in depth. You know, we talked about before the inter interview started about uh, Governor Bob Martinez. Obviously you were very instrumental in his administration. So we can start, you know, even if you want to go before that, we can start, you know, wherever you like. Well, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned the book and there's one chapter in the book that deals with the foundation of policy elements. There are basically five of them that the Republicans embraced right, right from the very beginning. One is tax policy. Uh, one is education policy. One is environmental policy. Um, and generally bringing the final one being bringing government in Florida, which was typical old South into the modern era so that it could be responsive to constituent needs and things like that. So um, whether we pick the very first of the Republican governors, Claude Kirk, or whether we look at the current Republican governor, Ron DeSantis, you'll see that there is consistency in all five of those categories. And um, 
it's been interesting to watch the changes, the improvements, and um, generally been well received by the voting population in Florida because when we began, there were basically no meaningful Republicans, all of a sudden a meaningful Republican minority. Now, all statewide elected officers in Florida are Republicans. There is an extraordinary majority in uh, both the House and the Senate, and uh, our congressional delegation, obviously, also Republican majority. You feel like that is, you know, you, you just said about, obviously, there's super majorities in the House and the Senate, obviously, the governor, uh, majority in the congressional offices, too. Two senators, the Republican, are representing the state of Florida in the U.S. Senate. With that said, you know, we look at the Democratic Party, whether we want to look in the state of Florida or nationally, but I want to specifically, you know, keep it on the book and, you know, look at the state of Florida. This is a party that in 2018, and we talked about this before we started recording, it looked like they could win the governorship. Uh, Nikki Fried obviously did win that race. Uh, the other two races with AG and chief financial officers, they weren't really winnable, if we're being no. honest with each other. But regardless no, I, I... of that, you know, there was two offices that the Democrats could have really picked off in 18. But even going before that, there hasn't been a very strong Democrat, Democratic, I should say, candidates. I'm sorry about that. Uh, whether it was before 18 uh, you know, or even after 18 with Charlie Crist, who was just running on Joe Biden. I mean, what a horrendous campaign that was. I know I'm sure you're probably friends with the former governor and know, but I, I, yeah, that, actually we represented the same county. So, <laughs> but he was a Republican back then when I was right. a Republican and then still am. Can't say the same about Charles. Right. That's true. But just kind of to get back to the question. Would you say that it's more of the Republican Party that the voting population likes, or it's just that the Democratic Party in Florida is horrendous and getting worse by the day? We always, you, you know, we can get a little bit into the weeds here. I make the comment that at the moment, the Democratic bench isn't very strong as you move people up the ladder. And the the opposite is true as far as the Republicans. I think better organized, better funded. Um, okay, so those are the practical things. Why is that? And I that takes me back to, I think it's the core policies. Uh, there's been a 50 year consistency. While the subtleties may change, the base policies have remained pretty much in place. And I think it's fair to say that one, the Republicans are very comfortable with that. We have more people moving into the Republican Party. We have in the last 24 months had registered Republicans outnumber registered Democrats for the first time in history. But as you and I were talking off air and before we began to record, the fastest growing segment of the population in Florida is no party affiliation, the NPAs. So when you're a candidate, um, whether it's running for the state house, whether it's running statewide, whether it's running for Congress, you've got to hold your own party. And then you've got to make sure you've got a majority of those who choose neither party when you get to the general election. And the message, I think, being carried by the Republicans at the moment, and actually a message that has been in general terms carried now for half a century, resonates better with Florida uh, voting population. And I... I don't want to overly criticize the Democratic Party either. I, you know, it's kind of funny. I was talking to a friend who is a Democratic member of the state house and he, he goes, I'd like a copy of your book. And I said, well, I don't want you to learn how we got to the majority. <laughs> and he chuckled about that. And he said, no, no, I'm going to talk about it. But part of it is a foundation organization that the Democrats um, let get away from them so that precinct by precinct, the advocates that are there on behalf of the two parties, there's a big void uh, in the Democratic Party in that segment. The other thing is you want that umbrella of your voters to include as many as you can have that are consistent with your policies. And not everybody has to agree 100% of the time on 100% of the issues. But um, at the moment, the umbrella for the Republicans, wider, broader, and there are more of them. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Again, the modern Republican Party in Florida, Peter Dunbar here on Firebreathing. Rob, let's 
talk about this. You know, you speak about in the book how a lot of people moving into the state did change those demographics and how the Republican Party did take over. You know, as a person that lives in Central Florida right now, in that kind of I-4 corridor, Orlando, Tampa area, as you, you know, you lived also in that area, that neck of the woods too. You know, I was always told that's the swing area. That's the place where most people are moving in. It's growing leaps and bounds every day. I'm not happy with it in some ways because <laughs> it means more traffic. Yes, it <laughs> and does. I war is hell. Uh, I'm uh, hell on earth. I'm in plain English. But regardless of that, a lot of people moving in are those people that moved in right now, you know, specifically talking about right now, but when you respond, if you could go back a ways, but you know, right now it's these Northeasterners, of course, uh, that wanted to es escape the lockdowns and the vaccine mandates, but also there's people moving in from the Midwest, Iowa, Ohio, and these people are more of that kind of conservative ideology where the people up North might be conservative moving in, but they're more like moderate left, I would say more than conservative well it's interesting you would say that we would be talking about this because it has changed over time mm -hmm. we have been fast growing for as long as through my lifetime for sure i mean i was born in connecticut when my dad was in school there um that's him and the airplane behind me if you can see it that's oh, wow. yeah but anyway um people come to florida because of the environment because it's comfortable. Oh, by the way, the Republicans have been the voice of environmental protection. People come to Florida and you were talking about the exchange. I mean, we've had Donald Trump's move to Mar-a-Lago and others, uh, I think built the most expensive house ever built in Florida down in Miami, hedge fund manager. Oh, guess what? Our tax policies are, we have no income tax. Um, we, the, the, Employed governmental population of state government in ratio to population, lowest in the country. Also part of the policies that have been created over this half a century. So people come from New York or they come from Ohio or Iowa preconceived, but not necessarily because of the politics. Come here and find, well, gee whiz, I kind of like the message. So someone who may have come and been a voting Democrat or an independent and shows up in the villages or um, on top of the world are going, hmm, I think I like the policies that are here. So, um, yeah, it's and it's also interesting when I began in this process, as I described earlier, the entire Broward County legislative delegation, all nine House members and all three senators. Republicans. Hmm. How many are there today? One. Yeah. Then also the entire area of where the villages is, are currently now all Democrats today for Republican House members to Republican senators. So the demographics of where people are residing um, and where they choose to make their retirement homes in many cases um, has changed the demographics, fast growing area, central Florida, where you are. But you know what? You'd be amazed at what the panhandle is doing. It was like the forgotten coast. It actually has a nickname, the forgotten coast, almost all the way to Pensacola. But um, St. Joe, large home developer, um, Windmark Beach, um, uh, I forget the names of these very large neighborhoods, but retired military, because we have Tyndall Air Force Base, Pensacola Naval Air Station, things like that. So there are things that when you get into the weeds, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go there again. Uh, there's some subtleties about it. bottom line is Florida is a population, a, a, a place people like to come and make their home. They like the environment. We're here to protect it. We want to not be gouging people for taxes. That's the big debate Congress just had. We don't have to worry about that here in Florida. Actually, the legislature just passed and the governor signed two days ago our annual tax package with tax free holidays mm -hmm. for school supplies, hurricane. -ridden. So, you know, it's some of it's about the policy. Some of it's about the environment. Some about 
personality. But anyway, sorry, I'll stop rambling now. No, you're fine. We, we I, I ramble also. I, you know, I, I'm grateful that you are spreading a great information to the people listening. I, I want to get into this because, you know, you brought up a little bit and maybe this was before we started recording. I can't remember. I feel like we've been talking forever but i am enjoying it immensely but regardless of that peter you know we talked about lawton childs obviously the last democrat governor i obviously when he passed there was uh there was someone for a brief time after that before jeb stepped in like his buddy name McKay. Was, yeah buddy, buddy McKay, buddy, yeah buddy. thank you um but re, you know let's be real it was pretty much lawton childs and you know oh, buddy yeah. mckay was a step in uh but besides that you know, he was the last, you know, Democrat governor of the state of Florida. What do you feel like Lawton had for the liberal viewers listening that other Democrats that have ran for this office don't have? Uh, one of the things that is typical of not just Lawton, but the other governors that preceded him is that they had a tremendous draw to their personality. It never was about the policies they were advocating that I could really identify a consistency. It was, you know, sort of that personality, strong, well-spoken. And Lawton, God bless him, um, we had the nickname Walkin' Lawton because he started his campaign in Pensacola and walked the entire state of Florida, or at least that was the message they gave. Truth was he'd walk through the town, get on a bus, go to the next town and start walking again. But he had um, uh, he had served in the United States Senate, uh, retired briefly, then came back to run against uh, Governor Martinez. But he, he just had a, mag, a very uh, magnetic personality. Um, Ruben Askew, very similar in that regard, very magnetic personality, actually made a run for president, but didn't get very far. Um, so, yeah, um, it as opposed to advocating for the policies and the things that people want to come to Florida for, it was more about the personality uh, that, uh, and, and by the way, we were talking about population centers. Lawton came from a very... Um, strong political population center. They used to call it Imperial Polk County. That's the Lakeland area. If you're a baseball fan, that's where the Tigers trade. Right. Um, other areas have grown much faster. We talked about the villages. We talked about the Panhandle. We've talked about the Orlando area. It's interesting because um, Orlando, which is now a huge hub, I remember as my first year on staff sitting in the House chamber when the movie presentation came on about Disney World. Mm -hmm. And in the following legislative session, when Reedy, Reedy Creek was created for all of that. And prior to that time, Orlando was just kind of like where the orange groves were. So the, the population centers have shifted some and Lawton came from, uh, in his career, what was one of the major population centers, not so much today. I'm actually on the corner of Polk County. You call it four corners, Polk County, Osceola, Orange, and Lake. Place is just blowing up, isn't it? Yeah, you, there's houses like, like everywhere. I hate to run on I-4 because there's too much traffic. Right off 27. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's terrible. It's, it's a disaster. But uh, we'll kick this around because I, I do want to get into some audience questions too, but I want to talk about some of the great Republican leaders throughout the years. You talk about a lot of these people throughout the book. Some people we will recognize when you speak about some of these leaders. Others may not, unless you, you know, obviously living in the state of Florida. Yeah. I, the, one of the things that's unique about Florida and is unique in modern times about Jeb Bush and the governors that followed him is that Florida, when this all began, when the Republican emergence began, had the weakest governor in the country. So many of the important Republican leaders that built the base that present us where we are today are from the Florida Senate and from the Florida House and the leadership that they brought to the table. 